you know, most when I was a junior in high school, so this would have been 1983, most of the stuff you heard on the radio was, uh, you know, more, um, there wasn't a lot of clean guitar stuff. There certainly was Dire Straits, and I was into that. Uh, certainly when the, the clean Strat sound on uh, Big Log by Robert Plant with old Robbie Blunt playing that guitar part, that was intoxicating to me. Um, certainly Stray Cats, when that came out, you know, a clean sounding Gretsch, that was glorious. Um, but the whole kind of Albert King, you know, that real hardcore blues thing was something I thought was sorely uh, unrepresented in the uh, musical marketplace. And in my young delusional mind, I thought, who better to fill that particular void than this gangly mutant from Wauwatosa, Wisconsin, that was going to somehow, by crook or by nook, I don't even know what that means, uh, burst through and become the champion of this style of play. Not that I didn't, you know, I had no concept that there were people all over the damn place doing it, but, you know, I, I'm my own little, you know, island of delusion. Um... I thought that this was a sneak attack that I was about to unleash on humankind. And then the David Bowie record came out, Let's Dance. And I heard a couple of tunes and I'm like, who's those playing who's playing those Albert King licks? Who don't they know that, that that's my thing? <laughs> I'm gonna do that. And I'm like, who's doing this Albert King stuff? This is ridiculous. That's like spot on. It sounds glorious. That tone is ridiculous. So I remember getting a magazine music rag at the time and it was talking about um, the Let's Dance record. And there was a picture of Nile Rodgers, the producer, with a Strat. And I thought, well, that's got to be the guy. It's a Strat. certainly sounds like a Strat of the thing. And then I started reading more and instead of mentioning the Stevie Ray Vaughan. I didn't know anybody named Vaughn. So here I'm thinking, who's this Vaughan dude? And I remember uh, it mentioned that this guy had a record called Texas Flood. And I went in to uh, 1812 Overture, which is a huge record store back home. It's long since gone. But I went in there and walked up to the counter and said, I'm looking for this record by Stevie Ray Vaughan. And they looked at me and going, you mean Vaughn? I'm like, yeah, whatever. So I remember I got Texas Flood and went over to my buddy's house. It was a Saturday. We listened to it all day. And I, I came home and um, I actually played it for my parents going, this is what I'm talking about. This is what I'm going to do is this style of music. This is what this guy is doing. It's right. It's exactly what I've been talking about. Um, but shortly thereafter, because there was such a hoopla when Stevie Ray came out afterwards, I was like, well, that's already been done. I'm going to do something else. <laughs> so when I got the 335, I decided my voice was going to be the, 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 the 335. And I actually gravitated towards the neck pickup on the 335. It had this very beefy tone, but that's what I went for. Um, uh, which I thought was humorous. Now, I should mention at the time, I had no idea about gear back then. I didn't really have guys that I hung out with that were into the same kind of music that kind of knew the lore of gear, other than just the stuff I read in magazines about guitars. I didn't really consider amps, you know what I mean? So I, I remember I was at a store one day where I bought my 335, and they had a Yamaha G100 212 amp. The guy goes, it's got a really good clean sound and a really good distorted sound. I'm like, okay. So I bought that amp, and that was my main amp for, um, you know, at least a couple years. And you know what? It actually sounded pretty damn good. Mike Stern ended up using one of those for a long period of time. Of course, he used an overdrive pedal to get a lead sound. But it actually, you know, it was a, it was a uh, um, solid-state amp, but I used that sucker because I didn't know any better. Um, then I got to college, and I started hearing more about tube amps, and I started hearing about super reverbs. And, and I got my first tube screamer and figured out what that did, and... And, and all that other kind of stuff. Um, and then I went, started the track. You know, I, I remember my first real tube amp, other than the twin I had that didn't work <laughs> uh, when I was in high school, is I bought a, uh, a Music Man RD-112, and it had a, uh, which is a single 12 amplifier, and I, it had a um, JBL uh, E-112, is that what that was called? The, the, single, the 12 inch um, E-series. JBL, which was heavier than hell, but that amp sounded good, especially with that 335. It sounded glorious. And that was my main amp uh, all the way through college. So from, you know, the time I was 19 through the time I was 22, that was 21. Yeah, that was my main amp. Um, anyway, it would be kind of fun, fellas, talking about people like, what records influenced you to start playing and all that kind of stuff? And what, what's interesting is... Uh, 
the records initially that got me into music were, of course, all my older brother's records. My older brother, George, who's the oldest in the family. I'm the youngest. There's five girls in between. So I room with my brother, George. So uh, I remember some of the first records I heard him playing. Um, I love Steve Miller's Brave New World record. Man, I used to rock out to that. Uh, Graham Funk Railroad Live from the Atlanta Pop Festival. Um, and then Cream, Joe Walsh, uh, certainly the Beatles, but Hendrix was the one for me. I remember listening to Hendrix from a very early age. Uh, Axis Boulder's Love, they used to put it on when I would take naps because I would play that one where he's talking about the spaceman, you know, open the radio station, DXP, and I would listen to that. It's a Hendrix fanatic. So Hendrix for me was some kind of supernatural force. And I, somewhere, um, you know, when I was around seven or eight, I really got into who this Hendrix guy was, got all the records. I borrowed a book from a neighbor whose older brother had these huge Hendrix posters on the wall and uh, really got into Hendrix. Um, but I was into all kinds of different stuff. But when I got to middle school, um, you know, it was Cream, Hendrix, Zeppelin. I started reading about Jeff Beck, so I got Jeff Beck Truth. I remember one summer I went to a record head and I bought Fresh Cream and I bought Jeff Beck Truth, both records that came out in 1967 when I was one year old. Actually, I think Fresh Cream came out in 66. Anyway, um, old records by that already by that point but um and i scoured those records the point is for the i talked about this with i think my buddy matt schofield is a great blues guitar player um and we talked about when we were young we really didn't have that many records but we just scoured and those records that we did have we scoured completely every nook and cranny for every morsel and i would put uh, the following records on that list uh fresh cream the blues breakers record um uh, Electric Ladyland, Band of Gypsies, uh, Axis Bowl is Love, uh, Live Cream Volume 2, and then Live Cream Volume 1, but I didn't get that until later. I had Live Cream Volume 1 first. Led Zeppelin 1, I scoured. Uh, didn't really have Led Zeppelin 2 until a lot later. Led Zeppelin 1 was, was the one. Um... But B.B. King, Live at the Regal. I got that damn record, and that made me realize where it all kind of came from. So then I went on this hardcore blues search, because I'd always read about, oh, you know, B.B. King would always be mentioned by, by Hendrix and by uh, Eric Clapton in interviews. So I got the B.B. King record, and then I really got into Muddy Waters. And at that time, Muddy Waters was kind of going through his resurgence. He had these records that were um, produced by Johnny Winter. And um, so the record's hard again, uh, King B, and uh, um, King B was a good one. The other one was uh, I'm Ready. So I had those three records. Uh, I actually saw Muddy Waters when I was uh, a freshman in high school. I went and was backstage, and I couldn't even speak to him. He came up, and he had two girls on his arms like this, and I just walked around, just looked at him, and went, <gasps> couldn't actually speak. Uh, but, you know, that can happen. Um, so that was all key stuff. But then I remember I saw the Allman Brothers when I was um, in, um, I think I was a sophomore in high school. They played at Summerfest in Milwaukee and they played and my mind was completely blown. I was like, oh my God, this is the greatest live band I've ever seen. Of course, I'm a sophomore in high school, although I chose high because they were one of the greatest bands of all time, live band. So then I went back and realized that my sister, Mary, had live at the Fillmore and Brothers and Sisters. And then I became an Allman Brothers fanatic. So I got into the Allman Brothers stuff. Uh, I should mention that the Eric Clapton record, Just One Night, came out when I was in 1980. Uh, and that had Albert Lee on it. And I started hearing Albert Lee. So then I really got into him. I tried to figure out this, these country guys. So that was a big one. And then another country guy I got into during that period of time was uh, 1983, the record... 83 or 84, Highways and Heartaches by Richie, Ricky Skaggs came out, which had Ray Flack on guitar, and I scoured that. Those are my first chicken-picking guys. Um, Mark Knopfler from Dire Straits. So I had the first Dire Straits record. I had Making Movies. Then I got that live record, Alchemy. I, I was like a religious tome. Um, and then um, I bought a, a couple of Albert Lee solo records. Um... And then that Highways and Heartaches, that was my first chicken picket stuff that I that I heard. And then I started to get some Chet Atkins records, um, but all that kind of stuff came in back end. I got really into the old stuff later. 
but those are my main formative influences. And then once I went to that jazz camp and heard Larry Carlton, I started to get Larry Carlton. Uh, Robin Ford with the Yellow Jackets on that Tom Scott and the LA, oh, Tom Scott and the LA Express record. <clears throat> um, then I got into Mike Stern, got into Schofield, uh, Holdsworth, all these different people. I can't, I always forget this and I can't forget it, but senior year I discovered Steve Morris. A buddy of mine was always talking about Steve Morris earlier on because I was kind of a blues snob. I was like, oh, he just plays that nah, 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 like an idiot. I'm talking about myself being an idiot. Um, and I got into Steve Morse in the Dixie Dregs. That was huge for me because he, uh, of course, fused all the cool rock and jazz and, and uh, chicken picking stuff. He was a huge influence, old Steve Morris. So I would say the Dregs of the Earth record and the first Steve Morris solo record were huge. <laughs> 